Anybody got time for doing nothing but listening to the Power Movement? Welcome. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and this week we jump back into part two with Rory Bushfield. And if you listen to part one, you know that Rory is the dream podcast guest. He lives an insane life, packed with risk, and he's totally unfiltered when talking about it. And the unfiltered part is important because a lot of people would be guarded as Rory has lost his wife, he's lost his best friend, and many others. But Rory has an unusual perspective on loss and life, and it's refreshing, and his life is nonstop action. Before we get into it, I need to let you know that I got my monthly email update from Traeger, and this is a new feature for them, and I love it. While I usually get annoyed by brand emails that try to sell me something under the guise that they are just sending me information, Traeger's email is more a monthly recap of what I did with their product. Last month, I smoked meat 14 days in a total of 40 hours of smoke time, and I'm going to ramp that up for next month. And you know I'm going to be looking forward to that email from Traeger giving me the update on what I did. Another person I need to thank is Josh Lubak. He's been sending me NEMA supplements. It's like a superfood and a vitamin packed together, and it really works, and it's been giving me a ton of energy that I've been using to work off all the meat I've been eating. You can try some too by picking some up over at nimabrand.com. That's N-I-I-M-A brand.com. I also want to thank the really important brands, the ones who make this thing happen, and I share information and discount codes about these brands in their ads. They are Stanley, Ten Barrel, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, and Rollerblade. I also want to ask you to tell a friend about the show. I'm not a known athlete or even a washed up one with a built-in audience, and podcasts are hard to find. So telling a friend really helps this thing grow and it's greatly appreciated. But enough with all the small talk. Now it's time for part two with Rory Bushfield. How's it going, man? Good, man. How you doing? I'm pretty good. Thanks for uh, making time for round two. Oh, fuck yeah, man. Of course. We will jump into it. And on the last podcast, we talked about stunts, but not as much as I wanted to. So with part two, I can talk about some things that I missed. And I'll say that you've jumped off so many things and done so much fun, yet maybe illegal stuff. How often do you get caught for your hijinks? Well, I mean, in most cases, jumping off of things, it's over before anyone notices. I feel like base jumpers get in trouble because they go always go into the same bridge, you know, the same. There's only a few spots. Whereas like jumping into water generally. You're in back on shore before anyone even noticed. So it's, I've never really gotten in too much trouble for it. Other than the Panama Canal was the closest one. Okay. And how many times do you think that you've ever had the cops called on you in life? Oh, the cops? <laughs> Probably a lot, man. Probably like hundreds lot. of times? I don't know, man. I can think of a few. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> the last time I was hanging out with McPhee, actually, we were up on this penthouse rooftop. And we took all the mattresses out of this apartment that we were in or that B was staying in with a friend. And we put all the mattresses on the balcony and then we climbed onto like the high, like the roof above. And we were jumping off the roof above onto the mattresses, you know, Uh like we're jumping off a skyscraper. Like, and (laughs) thing we know the police drone is like right on us. And there's like six cops at the door. And they come up there. They thought we were doing a group suicide. That's what they thought because we were like, we were all up on the edge, like in the sunset taking photos. And they had like somebody, we'd had like numerous calls. <laughs> like that was the, that was the last time I hung with people. Yeah, I've had, we've had the cops called on us a lot. Can you imagine that call coming in? Like we see some kids on the roof and we think there's a group suicide going on. We need to get you down here. Yeah, I think they're going to jump. <laughs> <laughs> we saw the drone. And we're like, oh, that's weird. Vancouver has a uh, police drone that's like super silent. I was reading about it. Then I saw it. I was like, that's that drone I was reading about, man. <laughs> it's so <laughs> silent. It's right there. <laughs> I read it can hear us. Whoa, that's insane. Yeah. And then how often does shit go wrong? Like you're always jumping off of something or doing something where there's so many factors involved that can equal injury or even death. How often does the dumb shit send you to the hospital? No, I mean, it happens, man. Most of the times I get hurt, though, looking back, it was like the big bad ones were just dumb. It was 
a stupid accident. You know, like the first time I blew my knee, I just was excited. My run was over and I'd already like hit the spot that we had set up the cameras. And I just went off a wind lip and did a seven and like with all, all my might tried to land in a flat hole. It was <laughs> so dumb. You know, I was just excited and dumb. It's like looking back at the injury, like when it's like for real, no, rarely, man, rarely have I, I mean, the consequence is pretty high in some of those situations. It's like, you, yeah. You can't really fuck around. Okay. And on the road, I'm sure there's stunts in every city when you're traveling. And was there ever times where the people that you were traveling with, you made them so uncomfortable that they were like, dude, you can't do this? <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> it's like making people around you uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, that's a factor for sure that comes into play. Certain people aren't into it, you know, and that's I understand. Okay. And I guess that's all I'll talk about with stunts. When we finished the last podcast, we were talking about you not making the finals in X Games. And at that point, you had also decided that you were done with moguls, where you're really going to shine in the ski world was filming. And that all started with loose cannon players at a young age. But things are about to get bigger. How did you end up getting involved with the Level 1 movies? Yeah, Level 1. And I got involved with Josh Berman through, basically it was McPhee. McPhee had, had gotten involved with them. And he was down with the loose cannon players. Like he had seen what we were doing. And so we actually went on a road trip from uh, Vancouver to, man, we went everywhere. We went Vancouver to San Fran to Mammoth. And then we went all the way to Colorado and Utah. We went through Utah and Colorado. We were like driving four guys in this little car with all our bags strapped to the roof. Just jump, like everything we saw, we're jumping off. And Bourbon was the best, man. He wouldn't say much, you know, it's like, so you can tell we made him uncomfortable in lots of situations. Yeah, we did lots of things to bourbon that. And what, we were driving through this town in Nevada mm -hmm. and we saw this perfect hedge, man. It's like, it's a famous shot of John going like over rotating his backflip, like through the hedge, like his tailbone, like skims the concrete and he like <laughs> walks it out. So it's bourbon shot. And then this old man comes running out and he's, scre he's screaming at John. He's like, because John had just gone to the front door and asked if he could do it. The guy's like, get the hell off my property. And so he climbed up and did it anyway. And anyway, this old guy chased us down. We end up driving out of this town and we get pulled over out in the middle of nowhere in Nevada. And car smells like weed. So we're like, next thing you know, fully like getting, so they were really nice to us. Let us go. Lucky because <laughs> Nevada is a tough state. Yeah, in Nevada back then, it was really bad. It was like, how, it was not a good place to have any weed. <laughs> so, like, you guys are driving around like a bunch of skaters, looking, seeing spots, making Berman pull over so you can do stunts wherever you see them and then smoking weed the rest of the time? No, we weren't let Berman drive too much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we were driving around. It was Biolo's car, so he was driving mostly in those situations. And uh, yeah, we're just finding stuff, man. If you go back through like the Loose Cannon movie, there's so many funny, funny like thought from that road trip. And then, yeah, if I spent a few more years filming with Level One, Berman was super good to us, man. He gave us like good segments in his movie, which gave us a, a little bit of a name in the ski world, got us into MSP movies. When he's putting together parts for you, I mean, whether it's Berman or MSP or anybody, in the beginning, on the front end, are you talking about how you want to be shown at all or the skiing that you want to do? Or is it pretty much sticking to their plan and then you see everything in the final cut and that's how you're marketed is based on what they perceive? Some guys were really good. They'd like save budget so that they could fly down and help edit. But I was never like a <laughs> saving budget to do, you know, I just sort of trusted the film company. And I'll say it was like a 50-50. Like sometimes it worked out for me better that way. Cause I wasn't in their hair and I had good in the movie. And then other times it was like, I should have been there, you know, because we didn't really put out what exactly what I was thinking, you know, it happens, right. It's like MSP, they did a good job. I thought of, and, and so did Berman. Berman was super good to us. They're like portraying us as like badass skiers, you know, cause some guys in those movies didn't get the same image portrayed for sure. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're really at the mercy of the editor and the filmmaker. It seems like in those situations, if you're not yeah. there on site. Yeah. Big time, man. Big time. 
I mean, everybody has their favorite part. I think you, I don't remember what you won part of the year for. Was it like push or something like that? I don't know. I don't know. I think so. But was there any parts that ever came out where you were disappointed? Well, probably, I mean, yeah, for sure. There was, man. Not to name any, but sure. it happens, dude. I can think of one, yeah. <laughs> I don't really want to talk about it, but yeah, they definitely happen. And it's like borderline, you know, as I talk to some people and they're so hype on it, you know, it's like I had a, a good example of that is I had a big conflict with, you know, the Kevin Pierce movie yep. that came out. Oh, what's the girl's name that made it? Anyway, she interviewed me and put Sarah in the movie, right? In a really big way. And in my eyes, I saw it as like she had basically used Sarah's accident to like make it so like Kevin Pierce is like quitting snowboarding forever, you know, for his family and his well-being, right? Yep. But they sort of like used Sarah's accident in a way that I was upset. I would like in my with my own image, whatever. I'm like in situations, just deal with it. It's like it's not that bad. But in that case, I was like, I was got pretty upset, man. And went down there and was like, you can't put this in the movie. And it was a big deal, dude. She ended up putting most of it in the movie anyway. It sucked, man. So yeah, that shit happens, dude. It's like, it's, you, you can talk to like, I know a lot of other guys that get really mad about certain pieces that they don't like how they were portrayed. It happens, man. And then if you think about the, the movie companies that you're filming with, I mean, when you're with level one, it seems like it's a lot of urban stuff, a lot of park stuff. And then when you graduate to MSP, and I say graduate, when you move on to MSP, it seems like there's a lot more backcountry stuff going on. And is it more dictated by what you want to do or what the film company wants to do? I mean, is it Berman like, hey, my audience is this and this is what we're doing. And MSP's like, hey, we're going to put you in the backcountry and see what you can do there. Yeah, back then, man, it was like you're basically just put into the situation as a kid, we didn't know what we were doing. All of a sudden, we were with MSP. Like, my first heli trip, I was with a bunch of OGs. It was like, sink or swim, you know? Yeah. That's how I learned how to do it. I, like, showed up, like, not much knowledge, you know? <laughs> I was like, okay, guys, yeah, I can ski anything. Yeah. And I could ski well, but I couldn't scout a line very well. I, I couldn't do a lot of things very well. Like, be safe or think about a place to be so I could save my buddy if he has a problem, like all that shit. You like never thought about it before. It seems like the big difference is that when you go to MSP, it's like the age of the athletes. Like in level one, it's younger and almost more dirtbag. And when you get to MSP, while it's far from glamorous, you have dudes that expect a certain type of lifestyle and they're not as much as hungry to be there. They're hungry to stay there and they have that experience. And is that kind of what you get from going to MSP? I guess in some ways, yeah, for a lot of those guys. I mean... It's always just about getting to go skiing, man, and getting to go, it's like, ski epic shit. Flying around and skiing, like, the best thing you can find is, like, you obviously, the bigger the company, the, the more shit you get to ski, right? So when we moved to MSP, back then, like, my first year filled with MSP, they paid for, like, it was the golden years, man. They were paying for, like, buying every dinner, all the food is, like, all, like everything's paid for. We're staying in these sick-ass hotels. Nowadays, they still, like, there's deals, obviously, all the stuff, but they had a lot of budget back then. They had a lot of budget. They had a lot of amazing athletes. And like you said, your first heli trip, you were with a bunch of OGs. Who were the OGs on your first trip? First good one was in Terrace. And uh, Scott Gaffney was there. He was filled in. And, oh, man, my memory is so bad. <laughs> oh, and Hugo Harrison. Yeah, Hugo and myself. And I'm thinking Abma was the first heli trip and he was rookie then too was it me and abma and hugo anyway hugo was sending massive fucking shit man and like he was skiing completely different shit than we were man because he's just like picking massive lines and like i'm trying to remember my i have a lot of heli trip memories but i'm trying to think about this it's like that was a long time ago man i probably got a couple concussions out there too yeah. Did you? Well, what I really want to know is, I mean, when I think of the OGs and I think of MSP, I think of McConkie. And you yeah. guys both love to fly. You guys both seem to have a little bit of a screw loose in a good way. Did you ever get to spend time with that dude? A little bit, man. I got to spend a little bit. I wish more. But I stayed with him in Aspen for a week. I never got to go on a trip with Shane, man. I, 
I watched every single one of his things. I was so inspired by Shane and what he was doing, man. I was blown away, like everyone. But uh, yeah, for sure, man. He's like huge inspiration of mine. And I'm bummed that I didn't get to hang with him more. But I did get to meet him and see his presence. And I've always been inspired by it. What other athletes do you meet through filming that you were either in awe of before you started filming or you became super close with? Well, uh, J.P. Eau Claire. He was my hero, man, as a kid. It's like he was the most badass. He was like, because he came from moguls and he became, he like started this free skiing world, you know, him and the Vincent Dorian mm -hmm. and J.F. Cousin, you know, we were like, as in the LCP, we looked up to these guys like our heroes, man. Them and CKY2K and like Jean-Luc Broussard is my other hero. Okay. <laughs> you know, as a kid. And so... I get to ski with J.P. Eau Claire one day when I'm like 13 or 14. My coach knows them. They're old buddies. And he, he's in town. So he's like, they come and pick me up in, in my coach's car. He's got huge subwoofers, like pounding big bass songs all the way to the ski hill. We ski all the, the whole day with J.P. And he's like, we're doing all. It was, I was the best day ever, man. I was like, I remember it like yesterday. At the end of the day, he gives me three pairs of goggles and like 15 lenses. And he says to me, he's like, you're going to do good. And I'll tell you why. It's not because you're good at skiing. It's because you're a show off. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he told me. Cause I was like, I always wanted to hit the jumps under the chair, you know, and like JP was, I remember his thing was to go as fast as he could over them. Like not even skiing moguls, just see how fast you could ski through like hectic moguls. Skipping the tops. <laughs> First time I ever did that, like getting going so fast, just eating shit in the moguls. You know, I was only 13, 14. And then JP goes on to be this incredible skier that I watched my whole life. And then, I mean, I knew him, JP, here and there. You know, we, we were on Oakley. We did a couple things together, but I never did a trip with him until, man, it was pretty close to right before he passed away. We went to Micah Heli together, him and me and uh, Callum Pettit. And had just the funnest time, man. It was such a good trip but with the Sherpas. Mm -hmm. And we hung with JP and he was editing his segment. He put a lot of effort into editing. JP was the guy that went down, spent time on editing in his image. He was uh, editing that street segment through Nelson. Yeah, that was so sick. I remember sitting there with him. We roomed together and I was sitting there with him watching him edit. And he'd show me these little parts. It's like, holy shit, man. Yeah. <laughs> so creative, this guy. Just so incredibly, like such an incredible skier and such a funny guy. And just like incredibly creative, man. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's, it was like really cool, really cool guy. And then getting the chance to like get to know him just a little bit after him being my hero, you know. Sometimes you meet your hero and they're a bit of a letdown. Right. But JP was just like, I kept just being in more awe. I was like, so impressed with how he lived his life and handled everything, man. Cool yeah, just guy. a nice person, thoughtful guy. And he was really, really good at like everything he did. Like not only skiing, but like you see him with, what was that little ball game that people were playing for a while? He's just like insane at all the different things that he oh, did. Oh yeah, he got good at everything. How about yourself? Is there something out there that you're not good at that you just suck at and you, you try and try and just can't get good at? I'm not a very good golfer, but I haven't really tried. Well, it's hard to say if you haven't tried. I don't like golf. What am I bad at? You know, man, I hate to say it. It's like I, <laughs> I'm a good snowmobiler and a good dirt biker. Like I can do certain things as like whatever I get by. But I'll tell you what, man, motorbikes – and mountain bikes and snowmobiles it was like somehow my friends man they're just getting through this shit without any struggle and i like i get there I'm like i've eaten shit like three times <laughs> <I'm> like <laughs> why the fuck are you guys doing this i find i crash a lot on wheels man i was like i love them and i could hit jumps and there's been times in my life where i have been like good at mountain biking but uh, I quit because I just kept hitting my head, man. It's like I so many concussions and tooth fucking surgeries. And just like I crash into my teeth. I'm bad for it, man. That's what I'm bad at. I crash. I'm nursing a broken arm just because I was just going down to the beach to go swimming. And I, I took just a side trail that I never take. And I was like, I oh, my bike's so sweet. It was like a little bit of a wheelie, you know. Now I'm going like fourth gear across the beach hole opens up in front of me i'm like uh oh it was like go to like get my front tire up 
get it up just enough that it like comes down hard right into this log, like break my wrist right on the handlebars. Before I even hit the ground, the bars twisted and snapped my wrist. I was like, again, motorbiking bush, like you fucking idiot. You know, and that's like just getting hurt. I can't tell you how many times I crash a bike and it's like somehow like tomahawk through two huge stumps, <laughs> like stand up on the other side, like, whoa. <laughs> completely fine it's like that's fucked up now it's time for my first sponsor break and i'm gonna start things off with stanley and it's already summer in my eyes and if you aren't ready for your camping hiking and general outdoor adventure needs yet it's time to get on it and you and yours deserve the best stuff out there and stanley has been setting the industry standard of innovation and quality and getting you out there since 1913 by listening to the powell movement you're going to get the best deal you'll find on all Stanley products anywhere. It's through this podcast. I'll get you 30% off everything Stanley. All you need to do is head on over to Stanley1913.com, go shopping, and use the code DRINKFAST. That's all one word, all lowercase at checkout, and you'll get that deal. Spend over 100 bucks, and I'll throw in a limited edition Powell Movement beanie. So please support the folks at Stanley and make sure you're dialed in for the summer. My final sponsor is the 10 Barrel Brewery out of Bend, Oregon. I love their beers and I love their mixed drinks. And recently, I've started drinking this new thing called Clean Line Hard Seltzer. And I've always been a bubble water fan. And that's what Clean Line is with an alcoholic kick. I'm going to guess that this type of alcoholic water drink is going to be a huge hit. And 10 Barrel has knocked it out of the park with Clean Line. They've also knocked it out of the park with the way they support action sports. If you ski, snowboard, or bike, you know 10 Barrel supports some amazing athletes, creates amazing events, and donates to causes like Protect Our Winners and the Surfrider Foundations. They put their money where their mouth is. So next time you're at the store, try a six-pack of 10 Barrel or the Clean Line Seltzer and support the beer that supports you. You can find out more about 10 Barrel over at 10barrel.com. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. Rosignol, they were a big sponsor for a long time. And that whole deal was a weird one. Do you go down with the whole Quicksilver acquisition of Rosy? Man, I got so lucky on that situation there. I basically was with Rosy before all those guys, like that whole, they paid out half of their contracts and all that stuff happened. I was out the year before that happened to Nordica because Nordica came in and they gave me an awesome offer. And they're like, we really want to rebrand our ski you know we need your help what kind of ski do we want to build is like do you want to stay with us for like a couple of years you know and it was like i signed for three years nice and yeah at first their skis were like race based skis they weren't exactly the, the what you want in the backcountry nordica was like atomic in like the early 2000s and then atomic got cool nordica wanted to do the same thing bring in some athletes and rebrand and get cool like atomic did almost and they did a good job. You look at them today, man, they're killing it. Yeah. Ski. It's like they did such a good job. I mean, I look back at that, like, what a good choice, man. I was like, I got so lucky watching all that shit happen at Rosino. Like, all my buddies telling me, like, nope, they're only going to pay half or a quarter of my contract. Some guy's not, you know, it's like, really? Fuck, man. And how do you go? They're in France. You're like, you're not going to, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Yeah. That was a lesson I learned. It was like, Fuck, man, you have to be getting paid a lot to make it worthwhile to get a lawyer and deal with it in another country. If they just decide not to pay you those contracts, like, it's whatever, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the end of the day, if you're getting paid from another country, they don't really have to pay you, no matter what that contract says. <laughs> so you got to be, like, a little careful and remember that when you do the contract, you're paid a little up front. Yeah. And in the first part of your career, your pre-marriage part of your career, were you doing okay money-wise where you didn't have to have a job at all? I think I might have even asked you this. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, I was, man. For sure. I mean, not amazing. I was in my early 20s. Yeah, I had good ski contracts and I was able to ski around and film and keep the dream alive, man, for sure. And then you end up getting married to Sarah. And I would think between the two of you, you guys are crushing life in terms of finances and careers. And while the mantra now is blow it if you got it, back then, was there planning for your future when you were married or was it all about blow it if you got it back then too? Sarah was like where blow it if you got it came from, man. She was making a lot of money back then, a lot more than me. She was killing it, man. She was buying up all sorts of shit, helping everybody, 
It was like full bloat if you got it, like full plans to make so much more money than she was making then. You know, it was like she believed. And it was like inspiring because I I'm a farmer, man. I grew up like quite frugal, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it was like I I learned about you know not blowing it. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like my whole life. So it's like that bloat if you got it is something I've learned in life. That it's like there's certain times you know you gotta also save it so you can blow it at certain times. But yeah, Sarah was the Sarah was a big inspiration on that one, man. She was making lots of money. There was times where we'd be like, we could go to this free sponsor dinner. And she would just like, no, we're going out to dinner somewhere else. And then she'd buy everyone dinner at the other place. Like, are you crazy? <laughs> Instead of getting a free dinner, you sent a thousand dollars. It's like, you're not saying, but she was living, man. Cool. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself again. And to reel it back in where we left off last time, because that's kind of what I was trying to do a while back, but I'm not good at that. It's about 2004. You're free to be at all the contests now. Be with your friends, be with your girlfriend, travel, be at all these events. But you're really not able to be at all of those because that season's the season that you break your back. How does that go down? Oh, you know what I did? Yeah, I went to everything. I broke my back at the very end of the year. Oh, okay. It was at Super Park. And I was just fucking following Candide, man. (laughs) Skiing with Candide. We were hitting this, like, the step down. Or I was hitting the step down. I don't even think Candy was. He's smarter than me. He's scoping shit. <laughs> I was hitting the step down with McPhee. McPhee knuckles the step down that morning and shatters his heel. Huh. Now I'm not skiing with McPhee anymore. I started following Candy into that massive, you know, where he does that five tail. Yep. And I'm hitting the hip and I'm like, I cleared it a few. Like I'm, I'm on the hip landing, but I'm looking at my tracks. I'm like, for sure, like two more K faster and I'll go right over this thing. So instead of like Candide was hitting straight the middle of the jump and they was kind of concaved a little bit, man. I hit the edge of the jump and didn't. Anyway, I landed on like the corner. If I was two feet on either side, I wouldn't have broke my back. I landed like right on the corner of the down way of the hip and compressed the vertebrae pretty bad in mammoth. And what does that look like? Do you get strapped to a backboard and taken right to the hospital? I mean, it's a broken no, back. No, man. I laid there in the snow for two hours and rolled around. And everyone <laughs> was like, you're probably fine, Bush. You're probably fine. <laughs> and so I clicked into my skis and I skied down. And I was like, oh, it doesn't feel too bad. I'm flexing. And then I hit a rail. And I like could land it on the rail. was like, oh, it hurt so much. I fell over. And then snow plowed to the truck and got in. And then the craziest part about that, this is like the early Rosinal days. I was getting Rosinal mogul skis and we had gotten like two pairs of scratches, the original like scratch, the red and yellow one. The naked lady on the side of it? And McPhee had them. Exactly. They were fret. McPhee, they were the dopest ski there was. McPhee had them and he shatters his heel with these skis that are like, he's been skiing on concrete. And like they're really slow. And then I'm like, oh, he's the sick of skis. I take off my fast mogul skis. And put on these fucking scratches that are like doper, way doper, but slower. And then I break my back on the table. And then I go down to the truck. This is all the same day. And Biolo takes the skis and he goes up and he hits a rail, slips out and friggin' lands on his ribs on like the donkey deck on the end of the rail. Comes down the car. He's like, I think I broke my ribs. We all go to the hospital together. (laughs) (laughs) It was heavy, man. They told Fee he was never going to ski again. And they told me that I was never going to ski again. I'd broken my spine. And there was like, you'll be really lucky if you don't have tingling. I was like, they're asking me all these crazy questions, man. It give me a bunch of painkillers. And fucking, and fee too. And Biolo, he just has broken ribs. So he's like light on the whole thing. He's hitting on the nurse. There's like (laughs) this nurse in there. He's hitting on her. Anyway, dude, we all go back to our hotel. We're like laid up in the hotel. And Biolo like, he got the nurse's number or something. So he called us before. Like, I don't even think we had cell phones. He called, oh no, we had cell phones. We would have by then. Anyway, he's like texting or calls this nurse. She comes up to the hotel. It's amazing. <laughs> and fucking comes in and brings us all gift packages. And then takes Chris out of the parking lot and blows him in the parking lot. 
That <laughs> is like, does not happen. That's like taking the stripper from the strip club. It just doesn't that happen. It was amazing. And she's like a cute young nurse who's working at the Mammoth Hospital. It was amazing, man. It's the coolest shit ever. We thought anyway. You know, we were all laid up, me and Fee. And, <laughs> and at least we had some entertainment. Yeah. And while I'm on the topic of contests and injuries, didn't you fall off an X Games jump one time and break your heels or something? Yeah, dude. I went to the X Games and I was hitting the jump, me and Van Valen. Just hitting the big air before the big air event. Van Valen was announcing and I was just jumping with them. Couple threes and backies or whatever. And then it started snowing. So I, I got to the top and it was like the event was starting and I'd been poaching, you know? Yeah. And obviously very gently poaching, like not getting in the way. Like I knew everyone there. I was like slapping flies. When there was a break, I'd go. And then it was like all of a sudden there was all the athletes were at the top. We like wished them all luck. And instead of just dropping it and hitting their jump, it started to snow. So I was like, I'll slip it for these old boys. And so I slipped the fucking jump, man. And I slipped right off the end of it. Like <laughs> I thought there was like a little table at the top. It's like a knife edge, man. And I never looked at it because I just hit it. And so I fucking slipped right off and fell like 20 feet into a dark hole. Nobody even noticed, man, It was which was great about it. I like tried to stand up, fell down, tried to stay. This was pretty bad. Shattered my fucking heel, man. And I like rolled myself off the course and under the tent. But it was like I was in that shaded hole right behind the jump. Like nobody could see me. So I rolled my way off and I called my buddy. I was like, you got to come get me. Man. <laughs> He's like, it's bad, dude. I like, go around the far side. I was like, I need to go to the hospital now. I couldn't get my boot off. It was it was horrible. And I was wearing my Bushy Wayne. I was using the Bushy Wayne skis, which were so fat. Like, they're sickest skis ever. And they work as long as you hit tranny. They're like, I landed on one foot sort of backwards on fucking ice. You know, on like a, like a, it's just dead flat from like, however high the X Games table is. High enough to break your heel when you land one foot. Yeah, 25 feet to shatter the heel. So dumb, dude. Yeah. And it wasn't even the shadow that bad. It was the fact that at the hospital, they didn't cut my boot off. I begged them to cut it and they ripped it off. I felt the whole thing, like my whole tail, like it all moved and shifted. Uh. And then I was in a lot of pain, man. When my dog did the surgery, he said the main chunk of the bone was fucking upside down. Uh. He like flipped the whole bone around and then it, the piece was fit together. Oh, that sucks. Yeah. Uh. I know, man. Fuck. So the next season, the 06 season, is when we meet. Do you remember when we met? Uh, remind me. Remind me. It's the most important event of your life, the K2 Back 9 in 2006. Oh, fuck right. The Back 9, of course. So Mike Goot, Shane Zox, Ryan Schmies, and myself, along with a lot of other folks in Whistler, put on this event. Yeah. And while it yeah. didn't really change skiing, I think it did have an impact on all events. And I feel like that in my head, but you were yeah. there. Was it as game changing as I make it sound? And it was pretty fucking game changing, man. And what a cool event. And to, and to pull it off, like, I'm, I can only imagine how many people told you, like, no way, that's impossible. You guys, like, it's too, and then you did. You guys pulled it off. What an amazing thing to be a part of, man. Fucking thank you, dude. It was ski. The dude's nine sick runs in the backcountry via helicopter with your fucking all your buzz. It was sick. I think the impact you had on Sammy Carlson could have been like one of the strongest. It was like, I remember it was the whole I won and he didn't even go in. He just did pow turns. Like lookers left. He was just all the way over there making turns. I remember it being at the top and like, oh shit, yeah, Sammy is like sick fucking powder. <laughs> it was the best, man. It was like, he was so young for that event. It's so cool to have watched him from there to where he is now. Like, look, cause back then he was sick in the park, but like that was maybe his first couple drops in a helicopter, man. I bet it was. Well, it was one of those things where we had people that couldn't make the event. Pep couldn't get into Canada at that point. So there was a couple spots that were going to be open. I mean, Ben Chetler made it all the way from Japan. Within three days, he was in Whistler from Japan for the event. But we had a couple spots open and we were able to get Sammy in there. Sammy is like 15, 16 years old at that point. Yeah, he's all about the park. And yeah, that was a game changing event for him where his skiing from there on. I mean, it totally changed, it seemed like. I'll never forget Marc-Andre's run on the last hole there. 
holy shit that was sick it was man. pretty was loose like, yeah totally out of control but he put, pulled and it all fucking together. dave's run too man holy shit dave treadway's run on that last hole was wild and that was after everything was over he wasn't even part of the event <laughs> oh yeah that's true man <laughs> that was wild that's right we all remember that run fuck that was amazing dude what a cool event dude and the other cool part about it is we rode in the callahan dude the zone that's like you can't heli there or sled anymore if you want to ride that shit you got to ski tour it it's like a couple of those holes we did right in the callahan we were we were before the time of the closure which is so cool man well we spent six eight months on permits for all that stuff so there was a lot of money spent on the front end doing the permitting, and I wasn't the one who paid for it because K2 did, but I was the one who did all the paperwork, and that was a total hassle, but we were able to get all that done. I think the hardest thing about that whole event was taking the 30 people, it seemed like, that we had to shuttle different places because you had <laughs> yeah. filmers, photographers, athletes, and getting everybody there at the same time. You know, It was like, we need yeah. to have 30 people at this heli, and as they come back in different loads of six, we need excursions taking them to this area yeah. to another launch pad. It was crazy, but it all worked out. Oh, yeah. So in terms of contests, I'm going to say that was a, a great experience in your life. But in speaking of best results at events, do you have any big results, any wins at a big contest? Uh, I'm trying to think. I think I got a, uh, mm, no, I bet those team events we did okay in. But, I mean, a big result, man. I'm trying, I won the, in my later years, not that it's on the top of my head, man. I won that hole in the back nine, though. <laughs> yeah, that was 10 grand right there. <laughs> yeah, that was sick, man. And the beauty of your career is it's not contest dependent. I mean, you put a shit ton of effort into filming. You put out parts like 10 years in a row. Is it filming that you blow out your knee in 2007? Yes. Yeah. That's how that happened. And so that sucks. But while it slows you down significantly, it gives you the time to learn how to fly. And that's become like your biggest passion, it seems like, since that injury. But is the injury the reason that you were able to have the time or were you always going to make time to learn? Absolutely, dude. That injury gave me the time to learn at a younger age, right? You know, instead of like learning now, for sure I would have learned, but then I'd be like where I was. Like I got so like not lucky with that injury, but I, my situation was lucky, man. I was living in Squamish with Sarah and the airport was right there. And I was like, I saw planes flying over and I always thought about it. You know what? I was just bored as shit, you know, crutching around. I was just starting to walk, I guess. And I went to the airport. I was just like, just started chatting with the guy and, and it, I ended up in a plane that day <laughs> and the guy's like, we can use this towards your pilot's license if you want to get it. And I looked at him and was like, seriously, man, this is like this flight right here. How many hours do I need? He's like 50. And I was like thinking, I'm like, so if I go every day for a month and a half, I'll have a pilot's license, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And he's like, well, yeah, pretty much, man. It's like, there's going to be weather and shit. I'm like, all right, all right, okay, okay, buddy. <laughs> and so I was like, I pay, and then I paid. I was like, oh, it's pretty expensive. And then my buddy had just bought a fucking hot dog cart, and he needed a guy to run this hot dog cart. And I was in this situation where I was like, didn't have anything to do. I was sleeping, like, sleeping in so hard because I was injured and then staying up all night already. Yeah. It's like watching movies and doing dumb shit. And it was like, all of a sudden, I was like, man, I got all this quiet time. I was like, I got tons of time to study and I can run this guy's hot dog cart outside the bar. And was like, let's see how I do. You know, at first it was like, who knows? But I did but my first night. I made like a couple hundred bucks. Like, Holy shit. That's enough to go flying tomorrow. Oh, wow. And so I started doing them by the end of the hot dog cart days, man. I was kicking ass, dude. It was like, <laughs> I was selling so many hot dogs from the cart and then just like creating other business around me that, that, it was a good situation, man. It made a lot of money at the hot dog cart. You know, Jason Leventhal started with a hot dog cart, I believe, too, outside a bar at uh, University of Vermont. So you're in good company there. It's time for another sponsor break. And now that ski and snowboard season is over, Peter Glenn doesn't stop. They're the one-stop shop for all of your summer needs. You want a pair of inline skates, a wakeboard? Peter Glenn has it and has had it for over 70 years. They are a mom and pop group of shops that do a great job competing with the cutthroat online guys, but still offer a low price guarantee, free shipping on orders of over $50, and a no hassle return policy. 
They support a lot of great things in action sports, this podcast, Johnny Mosley, and so much more. So when you go shopping, please check out peterglenn.com to get some of the best prices and the greatest variety of products on the internet. My final sponsor is Rollerblade. And if you haven't been on inline skates in a minute, well, you're missing out on the best kept secret in getting fit. Inline skating is the convenient and fun way to get a workout in, and it won't destroy your knees like running, it won't hurt your bank account like biking, and skating, it's easy. You can throw them in your suitcase on a trip or in your trunk, and you're good to go. No racks, no long waits for service or baggage charges. They're also the best way to get your legs in shape for ski season, and Rollerblade's Ski to Skate app is geared to do just that, get you ready to shred. You can find out more about Rollerblade over at rollerblade.com, or get the free Ski to Skate app over on the App Store. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. With flight, had you already started skydiving or base jumping or anything like that? No, really with flight. I had been on a hang glide flight. No, maybe that was later. No, I hadn't flown, man. My uncle had, uh, he was a pilot when I was younger. Like when I was eight or nine, I got a couple rides in an old Cessna. And then I'd flown commercially, but no, I'd never, I'd, I hadn't been around it really. So after you get your pilot's license, is that when you realize like, hey, I want to jump out of this plane too? And is that when you pick up skydiving or just how does the whole progression happen? Well, yeah, I get my pilot's license, I get an airplane and then I'm like, well, shit, man, this plane can't land there. How do I get there? It was like, I better figure out how to skydive. So I went to Lodi and learned how to skydive. And then got a parachute and then, uh, you know, it's like, that's the best way to get somewhere, man. If you have somebody to fly your plane home, you know, you don't even have to land. You just jump in with your backpack strapped on your front. (laughs) That was my motivation. Well, I wanted to do a bit of base jumping just for the same thing, man. It's like a backpack that you can get away with anything. It was like, I like base jumping. I've had some scary ones, man. It was like the last base jump I did was in Moab uh-huh. with uh, Jacko and fucking Matichuk. And it was scary, dude. It's like my shit opened sideways. I was so close to the cliff. Tur- you know, it was like landed, threw up a little bit. I was like, you know what, man? I was like, I'm not doing a low base jump unless like something's chasing me right. or <laughs> fucking it, it, it's, it's really high. You know, it's like it's a really good purpose. Like. Just for fun, I did it. I was like, oh, my God, man. Like, that is an insane risk. To t- I mean, some are better than others, right? Some base jumps. That one, we got there. There was a bit of a, a side wind. There was a bit of and It was less a really long hike to get back around, you know, through the desert. Like, not doing that by myself, you know. <laughs> I was like, fuck. It was scary, man. Base jumping is fucking scary. Yeah. And, you know, you have a lot on the line at that point because, you're with Sarah for a long time. You guys get married in 2010 and you're both elite athletes and you're going on these adventures. And is she worried about you at all going out there or is she just like, just make it home? No, she's supportive, man. I don't imagine she's too worried, right? She's out, she's doing her own thing. Yeah, true. And while I want to think of you guys having these adventures where you're constantly going places and doing different things, you guys are also so wrapped up in different parts of your careers. Were you able to get as much travel as you wanted to do together? Or was it more that you were working so much that you weren't together as much? Well, we got to travel a lot together to the same events, right? It's like Sarah did tons of stuff that I didn't go to. She was in between New York and L.A. and Women's Sport Foundation, like a lot. You know, she traveled a lot. And I saw her less. Than, but but then we was like, she was really good at taking, like, we did lots of trips together. And lots of times we were on the same program, right? We were out skiing. What I think is kind of cool is that you're like this ski famous dude, but your wife is way more famous than you. And while I think that could bother some people, I'm guessing that you probably thought that was awesome. Well, I was pretty proud of her, man. You know, she's doing some pretty incredible things. And she was like this badass, pretty girl that wasn't intimidating. You know, she didn't intimidate other girls. Like males and females were like drawn to Sarah, not like, you know, it's like some chicks are really good at stuff. And they sometimes are like a little bit intimidating to other girls, you know, there's like that dynamic happens. And then this has like, there's a lot of girls out there that aren't, you know, really badass chicks that are so humble, you know? And so Sarah, Sarah was that way, man. She was so humble and approachable. 
Yeah, I was so proud of her and her fame, man, and everything she was doing. She was kicking ass, dude. They're flying over to Iraq to support the troops, man. <laughs> she was doing everything to her. Yeah, and you guys both live a really risky lifestyle. And do you guys ever talk about what would happen if something happened to one another? Uh, a little bit, yeah, for sure. Like, do you take life insurance out on each other, or is that no? Just... We didn't have any of that. Man. Okay. No, no. Okay, just checking. No, we didn't talk about it a lot, really, man. It's like, yeah, we're not having morbid conversations really that much about it. Okay. And at the end of the day, Sarah is one of the reasons why Ski Halfpipe was included in the 2014 Winter Olympics, but she isn't able to live that. There was an accident and your perfect world was shattered. How do you deal with that? Do you isolate yourself? Do you start drinking? What do you do to stay sane? Uh... Yeah, I don't know, man. I just, I, I was definitely like torn apart. That, like, that winter was uh, pretty tough for sure. It was like I didn't do, I, yeah, I just fucking kept myself busy, dude. I mountain biked a shitload. I remember it was like me and Dex, we did some crazy missions together. We just go out by ourselves for fuck a long time, man. <laughs> it was like just biking in the pouring rain. It was winter in Squam, you know, so there wasn't much light. We did spend a lot of time like headlamp mountain biking. That was like the only thing I did by myself. And a lot of people came, you know, it was like McPhee came and stayed with me for almost a month. And yeah, I just, you know, I stayed as positive as I could, man. It was like, you know, I just put myself in fucking Sarah's shoes. You know, what would I want her to do in this situation? It was like, well, fuck, man, probably like what made her happy, you know, probably like what she was inspired to do and to like live out a purpose and to do like, you know, for sure that's what she would want, but that's what I would want for her, you know? So I think about that vice versa and it carried me as far as it has, man. It's like, I definitely want to do things that I think she'd be fucking stoked on, you know? Yeah. But yeah. It's a tough winter that winter for sure, man. It was actually Josh Duick and Mike Douglas called me up. I hadn't been out into the mountains and like it had been, you know, it's coming into spring. It was like, I guess, April. And uh, I hadn't been out for, you know, a little while. I was just sort of fucking, you know, just in a shitty place. Yeah. And they invited me out. Do it. like, I'm going to do a backflip on my sit ski, bro. He's <laughs> like, you want to come help? And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? I had been flying my RC plane a shitload. I was like getting super into RC planing, which I tell you, man. That was before I've got a tail dragger. I literally used to have the plane that I have now, but mini version, like with the same weight, same setup. And I was flying this thing everywhere, mountain things to it. So I strap this thing on my back and go up sledding with these guys. And uh, I end up towing Duick, towing him on his city up for all of his jumps and then launching my airplane with a GoPro on it and filming his backflip. And he messed up a bunch of backflips. I messed up a bunch of shots, but the one that he nailed and the one that I nailed is like, I've never filmed something better, man. Like I almost hit him with the air. It looks like what we see now, like an FPV drone shot. It's just a shitty, like that's an old GoPro and the propellers in the shot. Uh -huh. But man, it's like this high speed swooping shot. Like I almost hit him mid backflip. And then like, he, oh buddy, what a sick day, man. What a sick day. I remember just coming down from that, being so inspired and just being like, man, I got a lot of awesome friends and a lot of awesome things to do, man. It's like I was very inspired by that day. And then you get offered all these crazy opportunities. And it's strange to think that a big part of your success today or some of the success that you've had is tied to the biggest loss of your life. But after the fact, you went up with all these opportunities where I think it starts with some Nitro Circus tours in Australia. Yeah. Like when you're on a tour like that with dudes who all have the same kind of mentality that you do, that like will jump off of anything and do just crazy, crazy shit. Is it weird being put on a rock star pedestal for doing stuff that you used to almost get judged for? Like, God, Rory's an idiot. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that was a crazy transition. Man. I was like Lindsay Pastrana and Travis were friends with Sarah, right? And I knew Lindsay for quite a while. And it was actually at Sarah's celebration. Lindsay was like, Roner had broke his femur and he was doing the roller skiing. So they had asked Roner if it was all right if, if Bush came and did some roller skiing. And so they invited me on. They flew me to Australia. 
And I was like, all of a sudden, like with all these like dudes I looked at, like I didn't know at that point, I knew a lot of people, but I didn't know as many action sport people as I, for, man, I met so many basically because of Sarah. You're right. It was like, I was on the, all of a sudden on the nitro circus with all these super bad on my very, like very first day, the first guy I basically made friends with was Bob Burnquest. Okay. Him and I were like, bla- we're just out blazing together before every show. <laughs> it was like, you're hanging. Man. <laughs> he was super, super good guy. And yeah, man, it was really cool to all of a sudden be on that tour with that type of people and that mindset, man. And again, incredibly inspiring. Like, there's some bloat if you got it. People, dude, guys coming back from horrible injuries, like the worst injuries you could think of. And they're just like back on their bikes doing double backs again in a stadium. Just like, oh my God, like these guys are inspired. You know, <laughs> it's like some super, super badass people, man. I was super lucky to get to hang with those guys. When you hang with those guys, you're in their world and going stop to stop to stop. There's some crazy shit going on on the ramps and everything in the arenas. But outside of it, is there crazy stunts happening as well? Is it just like part of everyone's blood where if they see something, if the hotel's got a pool that lines up with your balcony, like everybody's going to be jumping off into it? Well, there is there isn't, man. It was like these guys are professionals, you know. There was like a lot of the show takes a lot out of you. But yeah, absolutely, dude. We got invited out to people's ranches. Where there was like, there was this one event we went to where these guys had done a contest and they had won the contest. So like, if you guys win, we'll come to your ranch while we're in Perth. And we get out there, man, and it was fucking crazy, dude. There was guys like, the first thing I saw was a guy riding a bull and then a guy jumping a four-wheeler like a hundred feet or like a fucking quad, like so big, man. <laughs> Yeah, it was pretty wild, this uh, Bogan Australian event. I almost rode a bull, but the guy right in front of me broke his neck and had to get carted out. And then the guy running the tour, Doe, he just ran around trying to make sure everyone was healthy. He like came up, he's like, please don't ride that bull bush. He's like, we need you in the show, man. He's like, guys drop like flies. And they did. Guys drop like flies in that show, man. It's like people got hurt so often that it was like, I made it through two full tours. And I was like, after like after seeing two shows, I realized, I was like, man, this is like, I'm gonna have to be incredibly careful to fucking make it through this. <laughs> it's like, this is some shit for sure. But yeah, I mean, I ended up like on the Europe tour, I was so sore. I had a hotel right beside a canal with a perfect launch into it. Uh-huh. I always regret not hitting it, but I was just so sore, man. I, had a, I cracked my scapula. Oh, man, that's a tough yeah. one to break, a really hard bone to break. And just in a wa- odd spot that I think everything you do, you feel. Yeah, you do. The old scapula. But if you stay on your feet, you can get by. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's true for a lot of the stuff that you do, unless it's falling <laughs> off of a jump at the X Games. But the biggest opportunity that you had was your TV show Splash that you did. It's a reality diving show. And I would think that you would be the favorite going into this one because you're going against Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and some other people. I feel like it's totally unfair that you're even invited to be part of this. Did you and the other contestants (laughs) feel that way too? Oh, yeah, man. I don't know how that happened either. To be honest, man, it wasn't like it was a surprise. Like, looking back, I should have tricked people and made them think I wasn't good. Right. And then, like, had this crazy learning curve, you know, if I was smart. But I showed up to the pool on the first day. Chewy, I'll never forget, Chewy Bravo's there. Rest in peace, Chewy. And he's like in the pool, jumping off like just the edge of the pool. And I just, man, my our whole life, we showed up at the diving board. It was like the very first thing that you do is like in the if you're a part of the loose cannon crew, you go to the top of the 10 meter and you do your very best trick. Before a warming up or anything, you go up there first thing. And, then, and so that's what I did. I just went up and did a double gainer. And Chewy, I remember being like, what the fuck, man? He's <laughs> like, uh, this fucking guy? He's like, I'm going to have to have your legs broken. So he said something. Like, <laughs> and then, yeah, of course, like, it was a bunch of people that, that had never dived before, man. And then me. I don't know how I got in there because they definitely Googled. They definitely looked me up and I had fucking videos on the Internet of jumping off of shit. Well, what leveled the playing field, I feel like, is that you blow your eardrum in it and the doctors tell you not to compete 
and blowing your eardrum is supposed to be a crazy painful one. It is. I think you end up winning the show doing a dive for the first time because you only got one shot. It was like once you were hurt, you couldn't practice. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Which was sort of a God ascend, dude. You know, it was like a, a gift that I didn't have to practice all of a sudden. It was, I'd go to the pool for like, I had it in my contract, whatever. There's a couple practice hours I had to be at. And I just sit in the hot tub with Kendra or like bouncing the trampoline a little bit. <laughs> so just like crack some jokes with Kareem, you know, help him with a backflip and then leave. And then, yeah, I just put that earplug in and do my jump. And I was pretty confident I could, but you're right, man. It was sketch to do. I'm not very good at front flips, period. Uh -huh. And to do them straight over, like they wanted me, you know, I was doing it on the trampoline. Like I look over my shoulder and they're like, if you do that, they're going to dock you so bad on it that Nicole Eggert will win if she nails her dive. That's what they're telling me, you know? So I was pretty nervous to do a double front into a dive off the 10 meter because a 10 meter can hurt a lot pop your eyeball out if you do it wrong yeah it's like it's not that big but it can fuck you up you land perfectly wrong you know like just the perfect belly flop with rotation you know it's like oh i didn't want to do that right <laughs> <laughs> but you end up crushing it you nail that one you end up winning that show which in turn allows you to buy a compound and the thing to me is you win that show and you're in like the gears of the reality show type people where people know who you are now and you've got a great image. I'm sure they want to put you on other shows. I hear that you're offered like The Bachelor and you're offered Dancing with the Stars. And you turn both of those down, which is crazy to me because you do a diving show that can make you pretty well known. But if you were to do either one of those other shows, you would be like a household name. Why say no? I don't know. I was sort of over it, man. You know, looking back, I probably should have. But I also was concerned about like, I didn't want to fuck up and have a shitty image. Something stupid happened. I was also, you know, thinking, I was thinking about Sarah's name, you know? Yeah. I was thinking about, I was like, what am I going to go on The Bachelors? Like, that's so cheesy, man. It was Sarah's parents. It was like, I love them to death. They love, we have great relationships. But it was like, I am sure it would be fine. You know, I just, at that point in my life, man, I just didn't want to really do it. And then Dancing with the Stars, I'm a horrible dancer. I was already, it was like, we wanted to leave LA so bad at that point. It was like, looking back, it was awesome. What was I even so bummed about? I had my best friend there with me. I was like, we were having a kick-ass time. Right. I wasn't skiing, man. I wasn't in the mountains. I had an airplane sitting there that I wasn't flying. You know, I was just like, I don't want to lose my ski sponsors, you know, as part of it. I was like, these guys are like, they've been so good to me. And now what am I just diving? You know, <laughs> I was just like quit skiing altogether to like be in LA. Like, fuck that, man. It was like, I love, like I, I, at a certain point, I just did like the waves weren't good enough. The waves weren't good enough to keep me there. They were good sometimes, but there's just so many dud days where I like didn't get any good waves and just sat in traffic. And it was just like, you know, I was just sad at the end of the day, man. I didn't want to feel that way. So I didn't do them. Didn't do those shows. And from there, it's like you come back up to Squamish and it seems like it's all about flying and creating crazy videos of just like your antics of what you do in life. And I was going to talk to you a little bit more about that. But at this point, I know we have a little, we have an hour schedule. We're a little bit over that. And I have one more segment of the show that's very important. It's called Inappropriate Questions. Mason Mashin asked them last week, and they were pretty good. I think you enjoyed them. This week, I got someone else that's very, very close to you. He's the best man at your wedding, Trenton Painter. He came up with three inappropriate questions for you, and he did really, really good. I was very impressed. I thought Mason did great, too. I'm not going to lie. But Trenton, he didn't know what to expect. I don't know if he had ever heard the segment before, and he came up with three, and he was like, let me just tell you them and see what you think. And I thought they were amazing. So there was no need to re-record them. I'm talking right now because I'm trying to find them on this little device that's in my hand. I want to clarify the other one about, uh, about, uh, what's the heart? Oh, go ahead. Never mind. Never mind. Keep going. No, well, let's Keep clarify. Going. What do you want to clarify? Oh, the last inappropriate question. Oh, I just want to say like, I blaze for sure. I, you know, it's like lots of times I said, I, it like helps me ski. It's more just the time that I take, you know, it's like to take that moment. It's like, whether you're blazing or not or whatever, it's like around flying. I don't, man. It's like, especially when there's people, 
But I definitely is like, I feel like blazing just gives me that extra moment to look at what I'm doing and think about it. And it's helped me a lot. Just taking that time, you know, nowadays, sometimes I'll just sit there before a takeoff. It's like 10 deep breaths, you know, look around, take in the moment. And I think that right there will like keep you alive, you know, being hurt. Like I'm already in a hurry to like hit something to just to take those 10 seconds and really think it through the last seconds is like, that's a gift right there. All right. Well, there is going to be a question about blazing in here, I believe, but let's go with the first question right now. Rory, what's the hardest you've ever partied and where with Sarah Burke's dad? Hardest I partied and where with Sarah's Man, we partied so much, Sarah's dad and I. We've been to Thailand twice. <laughs> is he just like one of the boys? Oh, man. Yeah, he's one of the boys. So yeah, he's the best. Every time I see him, probably, <laughs> like, we end up doing something hilarious, man. Gord loves, uh, he loves it, dude. He's, he's a yes man. Him and I, we were great friends when Sarah was with us. Mm -hmm. But, man, it's cool what happened to our relationship, dude. It's like, he's my best bud. And I would tell him anything, man. I was like, straight up. And, and I feel like he'd do the same. He's like very open. <laughs> it's pretty cool to have that relationship with Gord. I can't even put a finger down. The hardest place I ever parted with Gord, probably Aspen at the X Games, or maybe Trennan's thinking of something. I can't even remember it. We party so hard. I don't know. Gord lights it up, man. <laughs> he's, he's like, he has that light a bit like Sarah does. He's like, you just want to be around him and smile. He's fun. All right. Well, he sounds like a dude I want to have a beer with as well. We're going to jump into question number two. Question number two is, Bushy, you've had a whole bunch of sponsorships over the years. Why don't you tell us what's the worst a sponsorship partnership has ever ended for you on the worst possible terms and why? I love this. Man, it's like, I don't know. It's like Trennan's thinking of stuff I can't think of or something. Did you ever get cut by anybody? I don't know. I, I really is like, I've had such good luck. Man. I mean, so, I mean, Oakley and I, we, we saw different paths. Man, I, I've been so lucky in my life, man. I was like, and I, I feel like I work pretty hard for my sponsors. We have good relationships. We talk. So, no, man, I, I don't know. What's the worst way something ended? Maybe I pissed someone off <laughs> that I can't think of, that Trennan's thinking of. I don't know, man. I don't know. Well, that's all right. We'll leave that one at that. <laughs> the third one, you are definitely going to know an answer to, I believe. I'm going to jump into it right now. You got me boggled now, though. Okay, Bushy. If. For example, someone was to get busted in Mexico smoking weed and escape the people trying to capture him by running down to the beach, paddling out on a surfboard and trying to wait it out. But then it turns out the captors aren't going away and they're just stalking him on the beach waiting for him to come back in. What would you advise they do to get out of that situation? <laughs> they just wait longer tell you their buddy shows up in snorkel gear and switches you <laughs> did you do that well that's what Trenton did for me i was being the blazonist at the hot tub this all-inclusive and <laughs> the security of those all-inclusives are pretty funny i don't know if you've ever been there but i like ran off, i like grabbed what they wanted to what i don't know what they wanted but i just grabbed my borders of the beach and i just hopped out of the hot tub and jumped over the bank and grabbed my board and went out surfing and then I'm serving there. It's getting dark. Everyone's paddling in. And there's still like six security guards on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> and Trennan paddles out. He paddles out like he's surfing. We sort of casually talk. Don't get too close. You know, and then he goes in. I'm like, buddy, I left my ID. That was the stress is what I tell Trent. I'm like, I left my ID by the hot tub. What's going to happen here, bro, is they're going to find my ID. They're going to get our room number. They're going to go to the room. I got a big bag of weed sitting on the table in the room. We're going to be in trouble, man. It's like, he's like, I don't want to be in trouble. I'm an <laughs> Olympic coach. I'm not even smoking that. But I'm like, okay, Trent, well, you got to help me, man. Cause look at these friggin' six guys looking at me. He's like, okay, okay. So he, sur he surfs in, walks by the guys, puts his board in the room, goes in uh, and probably stashes the weed. And then he grabs his snorkel gear, walks all to the resort and like swims in the ocean down the beach, snorkels <laughs> his way, like through the waves. He scares me, man. He pop I'm like, holy shit. He comes <laughs> right up to me. He's like, switch me. I'm like, okay, yeah, okay. So the set comes in, we do a quick switch. 
And then I go snorkeling around, like end up running barefoot through this tall grass field. I'm like, I'm sure I'm going to step on a snake, but it's like an open section, you know, I'm like I'm going to be seen unless I go fast. Right. So, so I run through there, Trenton comes in, the security guards like are ready to like to grab him, And then they see they're like, that's not the guy. <laughs> like, what? They're so boggled. I get to the room and Trenton gets the room like a little bit after me. And I'm all, <laughs> already blazing, but I've left the door open accidentally. And so Trenton comes into the room. He's like, push, man. He's like, I just saved you. He's like, <laughs> he's like you got to at least close the door. Or go, like there's smoke coming out of the room as he goes into the hall. Yeah, comes down the hallway. It was pretty fucking funny, man. He saved my ass. <laughs> and then I like almost was just like, yeah, just being very reckless in Mexico. <laughs> well, that is an amazing story and a very good friend right there. I know he was looking out good, for himself yeah. as well, but really nice thinking right there and a great move. Yeah, smart. Yeah. At this point, that's the podcast, man. I want to thank you for your time. And like when I look back at your career, it's like you remind me so much of Shane McConkey and just the way you live and thrive on risky things, it seems like. It's like you're not looking for danger. You're looking to do shit that you'd like to do. And it just happens to be the most dangerous shit in the world. And that's the way you live your life. And whether it's on the right side of the law or the wrong side of the law, it's dangerous and it's awesome. And I thank you again for doing two podcasts and they're, they're great. Thanks, man. Well, thank you, man. Appreciate it. Taking the time on old Bush here. Try not to be too risky, but sometimes you're right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's just how you live, man. And that's a, that's a beautiful thing. Not everybody can be that way. Fuck yeah, man. Well, thank you. Thanks for all the compliments. And uh, yeah, dude, appreciate it. So that was time with Rory Bushfield, and that was just an overview of his life and times. I need to get Rory on again one day and walk through the details behind all of the stunts and get some more of his incredible stories. What a fun guest and what a roller coaster of a life he's lived. It's like he's had it all and then he lost it all at no doing of his own, and he keeps on pushing through and having more fun than anyone. I'm sure there were some dark moments in his life, but with his blow it if you got it attitude, you would never know. What a strong and awesome person. That's the podcast. Now it's time for the review of the week. And this week, the review comes from Amateos. And it's a five-star review titled Monday Vibes. I love waking up Monday and getting my week started by listening to the Powell Movement. The show gets me hyped to go up in the mountains and play. Mike has on a variety of different guests from both the athlete and the business side of the action sports world. As well as cool random guests like the guy from Anthrax. Go watch it. The pod is a must-listen for skiers, bikers, and any other action sports kook that likes to learn more about their passions. Highly recommend. 10 out of 10. Thank you very much for your review, Amateos. I'm glad that you like to start your week with me, and I'm glad that you loved watching the Anthrax interview. I just say that because I know you can't watch a podcast because there's no video element to it, and I'm an asshole, and I just say that. But I thank you for the review greatly. And you get yourself a Powell Movement beanie. It's limited edition. You can put it on eBay and sell it for millions. But if you would like to get that beanie, all you need to do is email me at mike at thepowellmovement.com and I will send it out to you once you get me your information. If anybody else wants a beanie, well, you can buy it on my website or you can submit a review of the week. And it's not a hard thing to do. So if you want to submit a review, here are the steps that you're going to need to take. First, Click the podcast icon on your smartphone. Second, search for the Powell Movement. Third, click my logo. Fourth, scroll down to where you see the stars. Fifth, hit however many stars you think I deserve and then write your review. It takes about a minute and it's greatly appreciated. I believe it helps the show grow, but I'm not sure. But it really does make me feel better about myself when it's a five-star review. And when it's a one-star review, it pisses me off. But either way, I appreciate you sending them in. So thank you very much. That's it for the show this week. I need to thank my amazing sponsors who make this thing happen. They are Stanley, The Ten Barrel Brewery, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, and Rollerblade. Have a great week, everyone.